Hello class, uh, this is Dr. Pope again. I uh, wanted to give you this lecture on cultural competency. Um, we will be uh, meeting uh, this coming Monday um, to talk a little bit about this. This is of course a very uh, important topic in the larger field of counseling and psychotherapy. It's an ever-evolving field. And uh, I wanted to propose um, a few things in this uh, lecture today. Um, I'm not going to do it necessarily in order. They're not, there's not going to be a big overarching statement. I'm probably going to just um, pepper some of these general findings into the lecture as I go on today. Um, I did want to say, though, at first that uh, this is much more about an attitude than it is memorizing a certain list of principles. Um, cultural competency um, is an attitude of the heart, and it's an attitude of professionalism. And um, I think several of you have probably had some sort of exposure to um, a course on multiculturalism or a course on diversity. Uh, some of you may even have um, a job that requires some diversity training. And what I've noticed with them is that you know, some of them can be very helpful. Some of them are not so helpful. I've been through a couple of them that were disasters, uh, not quite as big a disaster as what we saw on uh, the TV show The Office, but I have um, seen, I have sat through some really awful ones. Um, one of the things that I had you do in your forum for last week is think about this from the perspective of someone who isn't necessarily talking about it specifically, but gets at it in a roundabout way which is why I had uh, you listen to the Integration Symposium lectures with uh, Dr. Tama Bryant Davis, who I thought, without trying to, actually had perhaps one of the better um, treatments of cultural competency that I've ever heard. And so I wanted to share that with you. I was very excited to um, find a way to share that with you. Um, and I think the counseling class is the best way to share that with students because so much of what she talked about gets at the heart of who we are as therapists and who we are as people who suffer, oftentimes um, suffering from trauma. So a few things, uh, you'll, you'll notice that this will have that feel of a kind of a combination of things that you would learn in a really good textbook versus just some personal observations and some challenges to you. So first, why cultural competency? So instead of talking about the what of cultural competency, uh, we want to start out talking about why this is even something that needs to be talked about. Uh, well, for one, is that this is the, na the nature of the world. The world is uh, constantly undergoing uh, large-scale demographic shifts. Um, the, because the world is changing, then to be alive in this world is going to require us to be on our toes and to commit ourselves to knowing as much about the differences that exist between and in people as possible. Uh, I was uh, listening to an audio book just the other day written by Thomas Friedman, a book called Thank You for Being Late. And in this book, he makes the interesting observation that while we as human beings are not undergoing a tremendous amount of changes in our brains or in our bodies, the world around us is undergoing drastic change. Um, globalization, technology, uh, information, uh, all of this stuff is happening at a, a pace and at a rate that far exceeds any other time in the history of the world. We simply cannot keep up with all of it. And if you've ever felt overwhelmed, and I, I, I know I certainly have, uh, he argues that that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. That means that there's something right with you. Um, the problem is, is that we just are not capable right now of being able to handle all of these changes that take place so very quickly. Demographic changes are just but a small part of the changes around the world that are happening. So it's going to require us being able to move forward with great care, great sensitivity, and great thoughtfulness. Um, certainly we need that from our leaders during times of crisis. We need leaders who are um, able to speak truth, able to speak with grace and compassion and with empathy. Uh, you as counselors uh, or counselors in training uh, know that more than just about anybody else. We need to talk about cultural competency because there are also changes within the profession. The profession itself, psychology, as a large umbrella profession, used to be very male-dominated and very much uh, white male-dominated. But it is interesting to note that psychology was among the very first of the professions uh, 
to open its doors to beyond the uh, the usually white male dominated universities of Europe and the West. And for many years now, um, psychology has been very much open to the inclusion of women, where it, where it has lagged, and which is also true in many of the sciences, has been in the inclusion of uh, racial and ethnic minorities. And so that, uh, although part of that is changing, and not just changing in terms of we're getting around to it, but in terms of initiatives that are designed to strategically reverse some of those trends, um, there, there is some, hot, some sign of hope. Uh, on a small level, uh, we now know that uh, the majority of people who earn their PhDs in psychology are women. Uh, more than 50% are women as opposed to males. Back in the early uh, 1900s, it was almost 100% uh, males, although there were a few females in there. Um, we now know that uh, diversity training is a core component of all uh, colleges and universities that are preparing students to go into psychology and you're even seeing it uh, a lot at the graduate school level as well. You're, you are seeing it in terms of continuing education requirements which can be okay but I, in my opinion it's just not enough. Um, I, I feel like cultural competency, competency is at its very best when it's part of a larger commitment to help people who are training to have an attitude of uh, of radical empathy for all people. So yes, you need some specific information about specific races and minorities and ethnic groups, but you also need to have a larger scale attitude of compassion and empathy um, for anyone who is different. And that's an attitude that's reflected in the very best counselors. So it's a core part of our profession. It's a core part of being competent. Um, how about this, point number four here, there is a very, very, very good chance that the, f that the first few clients you ever see will be clients who are very different from you, different from you in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. They may be older than you or younger than you. They may, be, um, they may have a different skin color. They may have a different religious faith or creed. Um, chances are um, this is going to be the case for you. I remember when I was back in the 1990s when I was getting uh, graduate school training in this area and I took a uh, multiculturalism course that was designed to help psychologists um, do better with racial and ethnic diversity. The assumption was that if I'm a white male, then the chances that me seeing other white males are very, very high. What was interesting is that I didn't have my first white male client until probably a year and a half or two years into my clinical program. And so in other words, almost everyone that I saw was very, very different from me. And I think this is true for lots of people as well. Um, you have to assume, even if the person looks like you, um, that people are coming from a very different background than your own. And uh, so I think having a commitment, not just to specific diversity, but just that anyone who walks into your office has a story to tell. Anyone who walks into your office um, is coming from a world that is not quite the same as yours. And so a, a, a strong commitment to all forms of diversity is really important. Uh, it's now a requirement for clinical training. We talked a little bit here about white upper middle class males that tended to be uh, the people who uh, were dominant in psychology early on. Psychology as a profession uh, emanates from largely a white male dominated uh, Western European uh, cultural milieu, and so it's important that it constantly re-examines itself and, and checks itself. Uh, but this last point, I think, is the most important one, and that is, I, I don't. If, if you're not committed to other people, then cultural competency is not going to make a big difference to you one, anyway. Uh, the best counselors are people who are committed to deeply knowing another person's experience, and that. Uh, can be faked or that can be genuine, and the best counselors are the ones who genuinely care. Some uh, stats that we're facing here in the United States, um, here's a good indicator of the importance of, of multiculturalism and uh, cultural competency training. Half of clients who are a racial minority who visit a racial majority client terminate after just one session. Notice that's even when they say the session went well or even when the therapist thought that the session went well, there's often a great deal of disconnect in that area. 
Um, in the state of California, it's been estimated that today in 2020, about 62% of the population in California are racial minorities. We know that 50% of high school students uh, and uh, public school students in the United States um, are racial minorities, and that number is even higher in the state of California. We also know, and this is very important, that 75% of employees entering the workforce are minorities or women. And so this idea that we need to be increasingly aware of who it is that we're likely to be encountering, is uh, this, this is terribly important, um, not just in the workplace, but in our specific fields. Um, then look at this, uh, to get behind some of these demographic shifts, look at the number of births per mother by race in the United States. European Caucasian, about 1.7, African American, 2.4, Mexican American, 2.9, uh, kind of an aberration, uh, Hmong is 11.9. That's not a typo. And I mentioned Hmong simply because here in Fresno and in the San Joaquin Valley, as well as a few other places in the United States, um, this is a, a region of the country where many people who were refugees coming over from Southeast Asia and Laos um, have settled. And so the Hmong population is uh, growing uh, substantially here in the San Joaquin Valley. If you don't know Hmong people, uh, you will have a very incomplete picture of what life in, in Fresno is like. By the way, I will also say that uh, Fresno and the San Joaquin Valley is not just a place of refuge um, for Hmong people. Many, many people uh, from many different parts of the world have been coming to the San Joaquin Valley in hopes of uh, escaping something back home that was threatening their uh, families. Um, and seeking out a better life here in the United States. 68% of immigrants uh, to the United States today are Asian or Latin American. Uh, we also, this is not so much a stat, but it's something that I think is relevant, so I put it in this stats section. Racist attitudes that persist are often reinforced by systems such as medical care and therapy. Um, what we mean here is that it's not just the attitudes that are overt and harmful in the form of policy, although the United States often does have policies, historically and currently, that can be extremely unfair and biased. We also know that even the places in the United States where we would think that racial minorities or ethnic minorities would get a fair shake, those places too can reinforce the unfair status quo. For example, in psychology, a lot of philosophers have wondered why is it the case that psychology disproportionately diagnoses minorities at a rate that's higher than majorities? Uh, is there something inherent to their uh, status as minorities, or could there be something else? And of course, they're thinking that it's the something else. This last bullet point here says minorities are more likely to be diagnosed with mental illness and hospitalized, and yet they utilize mental health services less than majorities. This is very important. Psychology and psychiatry tends to diagnose more frequently that which looks different and not mainstream. And th than it does people just in the general population. And so minorities are already at greater risk for some degree of stigma. On the other hand, we're trying increasingly as a field to make sure that access to quality care is uh, available for people of, of all backgrounds, regardless of who they are. And so that's the hard part. And that idea about utilizing mental health services, less than majorities, is very important. Uh, there could be a lot of mistrust around that. There could also be just a lack of opportunity. And um, a lot of forces come together to prevent people who are more likely to be diagnosed from getting the kind of care that they need. And so uh, here are some uh, group questions that I often ask in my class, but I'm actually going to have you address some of this in your uh, personal growth paper uh, where I'm talking about um, your race, your ethnicity, your country of citizenship. Um, I don't ask all of these questions of you, these prompts, not all of these prompts appear in your paper, but they're ones that I would uh, likely like you to consider. So yeah, what is your race? What is your ethnicity? I would like you to know the difference between race and ethnicity. That's an important point. What is your country of citizenship? Obviously, that's a question that some people may not feel safe answering, so I certainly won't require uh, you to uh, write that down because in some places there can be uh, the fear of a, a very legitimate and realistic fear of backlash in terms of asking that question. <clears throat> but it's one also to, to consider in yourself, because uh, 
um, even if uh, that matter has been settled for you, you still might not feel like your heart is where it belongs in terms of your country of citizenship. Uh, what are three important values of your culture? In the United States, what is the primary advantage of being a member of your particular cultural group? In the United States, what is the primary disadvantage, if there are any? So these are some questions that I like you just to, just to be thinking about in terms of your own identity. Um, in the history of psychology, there, there are uh, kind of a few attitudes that have been around, and I want to talk about a couple of them. First is this um, perception of racial and ethnic minorities called the genetically deficient model. This was a very, very uh, popular idea back in the day. And believe it or not, back when this was happening, they, they, the people that developed it didn't think they were being mean. They thought they were being scientific. And of course, today, this just feels really painful even to look at. Um, the, the prevailing attitude was something like, racial minorities are not bad. They're simply genetically inferior. It's, it's almost like they're not bad people. They just can't help it. Uh, they can't help but not be as smart. They can't help but not be as ambitious. They can't help but not uh, get into the colleges that they're trying to get into, etc. And of course, all these were based on um, faulty assumptions. This was very, very popular from the 1800s even up to the 1970s, especially in a lot of genetic studies. Um, for example, it was found that some uh, ethnic groups, such as uh, uh, certain uh, t types of uh, members of uh, the Jewish faith were um, at higher risk for developing certain kinds of genetic problems. And they reasoned that the reason why these genetic problems appeared in Jews is because Jews were physically inferior. As it turns out, that wasn't the reason why at all. Um, a lot of it had to do with um, a diversity in the population, um, but yet that was nevertheless pinned on them as being an example of how they are racially inferior. So the, the big problem with this genetically deficient model is that it simply isn't true. It's, it's reinforced by bad science, but it also reinforced very damaging and false stereotypes and legitimized harm in the United States. We know, for example, that coming out of this genetically deficient model, the United States developed an immigration policy. Now, this is true. The United States developed an immigration policy based on the assumption that people who were not from Western Europe were probably not as smart and we're more likely to bring harm to our country than good. And so, for example, if you were from an Eastern European nation like, say, Hungary, you had a much harder time immigrating to the United States than you did if you were from France uh, or Germany. And so that was just based on this uh, faulty assumption that certain races were uh, superior in terms of their intellects, in terms of their brains, in terms of their... Um, you know, one thing that people considered a lot back then was a susceptibility to disease because medical care did not really start to advance until the early 1900s. Um, in the 1920s, after the flu epidemic of 1918, medical care and research in medical care was a big, big problem. And so people who were in charge of letting certain people into the country, they were very careful not to let in people who were perceived as being more prone to having diseases. And of course, Jews were perceived as being at a very high risk for spreading disease. Uh, again, that's what happened. See, that's not because they're Jewish. That's because Jews were more likely to live a cloistered life in ghettos and were more likely to marry among themselves, which raises your, uh, not only your, for the first part, raises your risk of infection, but for the second part, uh, increases your risk for genetic illnesses. Um, down here to slide number seven, then there's the culturally deficient model. This uh, model was newer. Um, it peaked in popularity usually between the 1960s to the 1990s. Uh, the basic idea here was that racial minorities are culturally impoverished and therefore in need of help. So the idea started spreading that basically there's nothing quote unquote wrong with racial minority. It's just that they need help. Um, and the idea being is that they've been put into a really bad spot and they can't help the fact that they've been put into a really bad spot. So the best solution of all is to have cultural majorities and people with power kind of move into the neighborhood and show them how it's done. And even though you could argue that some people may have had some good intentions here, there was a lot of unintentional damage and unintended consequences. For example, I, I remember seeing this a lot too, like in the 1970s and the 1980s where there was a big um, discussion about the, quote, breakdown of the black family. 
They talked about how um, the rates of single parenting were much higher in racial minority groups, the absence of fathers, and that people talked about it like it was this kind of an epidemic, and they just needed to learn how to keep it together the way racial majorities would. And so the idea, and this was even reflected in some movies where you would see people like, um, I remember that one movie, Dangerous Minds, that starred Michelle Pfeiffer, where, and you've probably seen movies like this where you have like really well-meaning white people moving into uh, the ghetto and moving into urban areas where the, the racial minority population was higher. And, uh, you know, it's usually this kind of moving story of, of people trying to overcome obstacles and overcome differences. But when you watch these movies today, they just feel so awkward. Um, and they feel so misplaced because there's, these are still stories written from the perspective of a uh, usually a white male. So these are the, the problem with this is that even though some of this may have been well-intended, it was still very naive. It, um, the assumption here in this culturally deficient model uh, is very condescending. It assumes that minorities need to basically drop their culture and assimilate. Like the best thing that could ever happen to you would be just to try to be as American as possible and copy us. If you just copy us, everything is going to go well for you. And of course, this could be uh, really awful, especially if you are someone who is very proud of your culture and very proud of the way your family has done things for years. Or you know, it's it's almost like they're assuming that everything about you is needs correcting and needs fixing. So this was really popular in the 1960s through 90s, and you still see examples of this to this day. The culturally diverse or culturally different model is the one proposed by um, the, uh, the, the author of a very popular test, text on uh, diversity, um, Sue and Sue. Um, presently a very popular approach, although in and of itself not perfect either. Um, the basic idea is that all cultural and racial views are considered to be valid or good or acceptable, right? That's something that we uh, understand to be a given. It's a basic. You are who you are. Um, health is defined by how you define health, not necessarily by how the people in charge define health. So health standards are not based on a single model of health or normalcy. So as an example, like, and this was one that I showed up in a few texts as well, like, what do you do with something like machismo? And what do you do when you're a therapist who's trained in this very Western model of trying to treat people equally and not coming across as being domineering or aggressive? What do you do when you have something like machismo and that runs up against a term like authoritarianism, which exists in psychology? So the idea would be to say, you know, traditionally, that you need to stop acting in a, in a way that, that reflects machismo and understand that that's very harmful to people and very hurting to people, and here's a much better way. The current model says, no, machismo is very much a part of the culture, and that needs to be embraced, even if it doesn't necessarily uh, achieve what is wanted, and even though there may be a different way that could be also available to someone who exhibits uh, machismo tendencies, um, that it's nevertheless something that is uh, that doesn't need to be stamped out. It's something that can be encouraged and it's something you can be proud of. The problem with the culturally diverse or culturally different model is a problem of implementation. Old habits die hard. A lot of people intensely, intensely, intensely dislike diversity models. And there are some realistic questions about whether they're even effective or realistic. So what are we getting at here? Well, it ha this is something that has been tried imperfectly around the world. Uh, the most notable example is the country of Germany. In Germany, uh, where they're still very sensitive to the fact that in their history they had Nazism, um, th there was basically for the last 15 or 20 years a big movement to drown out all voices of nationalism. Um, for example, I know in some cities it was considered to be illegal to fly the German flag. That seems like a really weird thing to say. You're, what do you mean you're not allowed to fly the German flag? Well, if you fly the German flag, this was thought to be associated with nationalism. And if you're showing strong signs of nationalism, how far away from that is, is Nazism? And because they were very sensitive to not want to go down that road, basically Germany adopted this model of saying anything that is different, anything that is from another country, anything that's from another culture is welcome and championed and valued. 
But anything that looks really German or anything that looks really traditionally German is going to be downplayed. And they said that this led to a tremendous amount of tension and strife within the country and that it actually had all sorts of unintended consequences. So believe it or not, even though right now we're living in a world in which we really value racial and ethnic diversity, you may have heard a term called unity and diversity, where in some ways we are united, like maybe we might all be citizens of the same country, but then we also have this diversity idea that we're like a, uh, that our country, even though we are unified in so many ways and we have very similar values, there may be some other ways where our values clash or might not be quite on the same page. This model is really being challenged. In fact, a lot of research is being done right now that says that diversity causes a great deal of problems with a society. Now, this may sound very controversial because diversity sounds, on the face of it, like a very beautiful thing. Like, shouldn't we be championing and valuing all people from all cultures and giving them a shot? Well, the idea here is that it actually is resulting in a lot of problems. Um, it's had a lot of unintended consequences. A lot of social psychologists are actually now uh, changing their mind on this and saying that in the next 15 or 20 years, we need to be focusing less on diversity and much more on unity. That doesn't mean that we drown out voices of, of diversity, but that unity is far more compelling for people. Um, and in fact, they're saying that even people who are um, coming from a, uh, a racial minority perspective, if they themselves identify as a racial or ethnic or cultural minority, that they are, they feel like the the move toward racial diversity is is often done in a very imperfect way. It's often done in an awkward way, and sometimes it causes more harm than good. So we'll stay tuned and see what happens here, because there are a lot of voices now who are saying that this cultural diversity model may not be uh, all it's cracked up to be. So uh, let's stay tuned on that one. Okay, moving now to slide number nine. Um, this is the uh, perspective of individual versus collective identities. So psychology traditionally emanates from an individual individualistic perspective focused on the self. That shouldn't surprise you because it uh, was based in uh, Western Europe, which very much values individualism. The irony is that when you look at the individualistic approach, it tends to result in a lack of self-awareness. Because after all, we know who we are best when we are in context. And so it's really weird. Psychology wants us to know ourselves well and to have good insight into ourselves. But you can't really do that very well when you are constantly being by yourself. You know yourself best when you are with other people. And so that's, there's a basic um, paradox there at the very beginning of this uh, individualistic identity in psychology. This is changing with an emerging need to consider other approaches in psychology, and I think for the better. But both approaches have merits and drawbacks. Uh, one bit of advice I encourage is don't exclude one entirely. There are really good things about being from a more collective culture. There are really good things about being from a more uh, individual culture. Uh, it's just you need to know what the good and the bad things are and uh, understand how that's going to affect you. Individual approaches tend to emphasize autonomy, independence, self-reliance, self-discipline, individual responsibility, and carving out one's destiny. And a lot of this is shaped by what's called the Western Protestant work ethic. And that comes out in other things that you may have heard of, like the American dream. Uh, people talk about the American dream as owning a house. Well, maybe owning a house is the American dream, but the American dream traditionally has been about rugged individualism, pulling oneself up by the bootstraps, grabbing a piece of the pie, uh, being a, a self-made man, uh, being able to overcome lots of obstacles, being an underdog. This is kind of the story that culturally means a lot to Americans. Uh, Americans tend to really gravitate towards these kinds of stories. Um, what are the merits of this? Well, obviously, when you have accomplished something or achieved something, it leads to self-confidence and a sense of uh, pride and uh, a sense of achievement. The problem is, is that it's an unequal playing field, obviously. Uh, not everybody has the op same opportunity to achieve that other people do. So this view also tends to view people who don't have it together as bringing it upon themselves. Uh, you, you, might say thing, you might hear racial majorities say things like, we're all created equally. Uh, if you want to be successful in this country, you can't be too sensitive. You just have to work really, really, really hard. 
And of course, uh, we've been noting for years that not everybody has the same opportunity to do that. So we definitely live in a uh, society that tends to blame victims. We tend, and, and there's social psychologists have been noting this for years. Collective societies tend to approach uh, things with a view towards group identity rather than individual identity. So collective approaches to therapy tend to value collective responsibility, interdependence, loyalty to family and ethnic groups, and knowing one's role. Uh, identity is more about who you are within the context of a group and your membership in that group rather than your individual identity. An example that comes up uh, quite a bit in our society Let's imagine there's a young girl who comes from a more collectivist culture, and she may be ready to go to college. She has really good grades, but she might not decide to go to college because she is needed to care for a sick family member. Now, if you come from a more individualistic culture, that culture would put enormous pressure on this girl to forget the sick family member and go away to college. It's not so easy in a more collectivist uh, kind of culture. It's not to say that the collectivist culture wouldn't value college. It's to say that you may have more things to consider uh, beyond just your own needs. The merits of such an approach is that one rarely feels alone and you can count on others to care for them. There's a lot of group pride. For example, that same girl who may be getting ready to go off to college, uh, her going to college may be a source of enormous pride and a, con and a feeling of accomplishment for other family members, uh, maybe parents, for example, who didn't go to college. And so this is wonderful problem with the collectivist cultures is that there can sometimes be too much pressure to conform to the standards of the group. And when you don't, it runs the risk of people who are quote unquote rebellious being rejected or ostracized or shunned from the community. Let's go ahead and stop there and we'll do uh, the last several slides um, uh, in part two.